Uh, welcome to the TNW TV. I'm here. Uh, my name is Mar, and I'm editor at the Next Web. And I'm here with James Beecham, uh, physical part. Uh, yeah. Well, maybe it's a tricky job title. I feel so. So, what is actually a particle physicist? Yeah, so I am James Beecham. I'm a particle physicist at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, where I use the largest experiment in human history to uh, briefly recreate the conditions of the universe as they were a fraction of a second after the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. And we do this because we want to know what uh, the basic, uh, some of the answers to the, some of the most basic questions of, uh, of physics and science right now. But So at, uh, what's a normal day when you're... At CERN, so you have the large heart and collider. Or are you just constantly punching out particles all day, or are you just constantly making them smash into each other? Yeah, so the the project is huge. So I work at CERN, you know, this big uh, particle physics lab near uh, Geneva, Switzerland, and uh, the biggest project there is this thing called the Large Hadron Collider, the 27 kilometer circular tunnel that's underground on the border of France and Switzerland. And in the tunnel, we use uh, we have two beams of protons. You, you're all made of protons, and we we bend these protons around this ring, and we get them to go around this ring many, many times. Times, thousands of times until they get the extremely high energies and then we slam them into each other uh, 40 million times a second and we do this for weeks and months and years so typical day is you know you help the detector uh, make sure that it's analyzing or it's collecting the data correctly uh, you talk with your colleagues in meetings long long meetings all day long you do some uh, some the very be definition of big data data analysis um, uh, and then at the end of the day you have a beer and see if you've discovered a particle in your new in your new data usually we don't it was quite controversial when it was built, the Hydron Collider, but now there's ideas, we actually covered this earlier this year, there, there are ideas about building an even larger one also in uh, at CERN. Yes. So why do we need, why does it have to be bigger? I mean, we already, I mean, particles are that small, we are already colliding together, why does size matter? Yeah, size absolutely matters in particle physics um, because the we are limited by our ability to get to higher energies. And when I say higher energies, I mean the, the speed to which we can accelerate these particles before we collide them into each other. We're limited by the size of the ring. It has to do with various different things within our technology. Um, but you remember Einstein, E equals mc squared. And this, it, for particles, what this means is there's an equivalence between energy and mass. And the m part mass is just a number. For particles, it's just a number put there by nature. We don't control it. We just have to go out and measure it. So if so, the, but the part we can control is the E part, the energy part. And if we, as a species, have never built an experiment with an you know with an energy that gets up high enough, imagine nature has a particle with a mass m with a, that's way up here, and we, as a species, have only ever built an exper experiment accelerated to get to energy here. We'll never discover it. We'll never know anything about it. And this is the part that could answer all of our open questions of science, like what is dark matter? Why is gravity so weak? Uh, uh, how do black holes really work inside them? Things like this. The biggest open questions. Uh, why is the universe expanding so quickly? Uh, so, and so we have to go to bigger, uh, do we have to go to higher energies, bigger machines, uh, and that's the only way we can really explore the unknown at the moment. You say this is the largest experiment that humankind has ever done, uh, and it seems really ambitious, and it's interesting to see that we're trying to go even further, but it still begs the question, why should the normal person care? Why should we spend billions of dollars on a, well, what some people might see as a pet project for science? That is really disappointing to hear anyone say. <laughs> and I know what, where you're coming from when you say this, but you know, I get, we get this question quite a bit. And as a physicist, it's totally quizzical and bizarre because you're like, wait a minute, how can no one? How could anyone think that this is a bad idea? We're exploring the basic mysteries of nature here. This is pure. This is science for pure curiosity's sake. Uh, and so it's it, it makes your brain hurt a little bit where you're like, you have to think, okay, hold on, not everyone understands exactly why I'm doing what I do. Um, but at the end of the day, why we do what we do is why. It's important to everyone around us is because particle physics really addresses some of the most basic questions that humans have ever had. I mean, really, particle physics, even though we're colliding protons in this big experiment with superconducting magnets, really all we're doing is we're trying to answer some very, very basic questions, such as where did we come from? How does everything work around us? And where are we going? That's what particle physics is trying to answer. So when we try to answer these questions, we're really addressing kind of the key existential questions of, of humanity, of, of, of existence. In a practical sense, though, 
you can also answer the question, anytime your species, anytime we as, a, as humanity do something like this, no one's ever built, so this next planned collider is something called the Future Circular Collider, it'll get a better name in the future, um, but it's called the FCC and it's going to be something like four times as big as the Large Hadron Collider and get to energy seven times as high. That's amazing, that opens up completely uncharted uh, uh, you know, potential. And you have to keep in, in mind, even though it seems like a large amount of resources, it seems like we're, you know, we're using a lot of uh, uh, time and money and, and person power to make this happen. This, this entire project, for example, is planned to be something like from now to when it will probably stop taking data, will be 70 years, 70 years. The entire budget of that is planned to be less than 5% of one year of the mili US military budget. So if anyone tells you that these are some kind of drain on society, tell them they're crazy. In a practical sense, what society gets out of this type of research is un incalculable. Really, I don't know if I could put a dollar amount on or a euro amount on the amount of uh, that, that is contributed to the economy because of this type of research. Because you train people that are wonderful, brilliant thinkers and problem solvers, and there's not that many jobs at the very, very top of particle physics, and so a lot of people will go into other industries. You always end up, anytime your species does something like this, you always end up inventing new technologies to make it happen. Because no one's ever done this. Anytime this tech, so you invent these new technologies that can then be transferred to industry. So there's big banner, uh, ex you know, examples in the past. So if you've ever known anyone that's had a cancer, either treated or detected by, say, t a CT scan or a PET scan, this w no one invented this. This was just a side benefit of my particle physics forebears messing around with phys physics and particles. Somebody said, hey, we could use this to image the inside of bodies. Also, the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web was invented at, at, at CERN by you know phys physicists to more effectively shared data, uh, physics data around the world and now you can watch you know cat videos anywhere you are so the, the transformative and that's thanks to particle physics thanks to particle physics <laughs> and so particle physics research this type of stuff I think of it as kind of open-ended humanity R&D because you don't have any idea what's going to come out of it and that's good it's always guaranteed to have new new inventions and new uh, benefit to, to society but for me I do it just because you know I want to know what dark matter is I want to know uh, how how the universe works and you say you want to know what dark matter is, but so this is a term that I think people mostly see in science fiction, the people that are not working in the field. How would you explain dark matter in a really simple manner? Yeah, so dark matter seems mysterious. When we use that word dark, sometimes it means that you know it's mysterious or weird or something like that. But in this case, we mean something sim simple. We know that there has to be more stuff in the universe than what we can see with our eyes. Because, for example, if you look at uh, some spiral galaxy, like everybody loves Hubble photos, right? Take your favorite Hubble photo and look, count up all the stuff you can see. And then you th that allows you to calculate how much mass is in that galaxy. And then go out and see how, uh, how fast a certain star is supposed to be moving as a function of how far away from the center of the galaxy it is. And it's totally off from the prediction. So there has to be, all of the galaxies are spinning way faster than they should. And so what that means is that there's either two, one of two things is, is wrong here. Either our understanding of gravity is wrong, and it's probably not, or there's got to be more stuff there than what we can see with our eyes. And if it's not light, if it doesn't interact via light, then it, it is dark. So that's where the dark matter part comes from. And this is all galaxies, all the, all the time. You have about a billion particles of dark matter going through your body every second. You've never felt it. So that just means it's really hard to detect. So under the assumption that it is some kind of particle and it's, uh, and it's around us in the abundance that we can calculate to help us understand, uh, to help us explain why we see these weird, these weird behaviors in, in galaxies due to gravity, and, uh, um, then you assume that it's a particle and you try to then create it in a laboratory so you can, uh, you can measure it. Your talk later today is going beyond um uh, is going beyond the universe. So is that moving even further from dark matter or is that, so do you actually mean the uh, universe we can see with the, um, with the technology that we have today or are you looking even further beyond that? I mean, even look at, so the talk, the talk today will not be so much about dark matter, but it's going to be in a slightly different direction. So dark matter, we assume it, we 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 know has to be everywhere in the universe in different abundances. It's still clusters around galaxies and things like that. But what I'm going to be talking about today is really a more even existential question, where you ask the question, what is outside the universe? How do we even think about what it, what's outside the universe? How do we define the universe? And how could we ever possibly answer this question? Is this is it, is it a scientific question? So um, dark Dark matter, we assume, is everywhere in the universe, but then this is a kind of an alternate question where we <clears throat> we understand everything about around our universe, you know, around us in our universe quite well, but then 
we also know that some of the things that we observe about our current universe, the, way, the universe, the way that it's expanding, the way everything's distributed, it makes us start to think that there has to be something strange about our universe. And so you might then, alt uh, some people then lead to the conclusion that we actually might live in a multiverse. There might be a, an almost infinite number of other universes. The question is, is this a scientific question? Because could we ever design an experiment to definitively test this? And that's the question. That's what I'm going to be talking about today. And finally, what's your favorite particle? You must have some kind of favorite. <laughs> <laughs> favorite particle. Ah, it's like your children, right? How many, how many choose well, one? Well, I mean, you know, like, well, like with children, you always have a favorite. Yeah. I, I am particularly fond of photons, to be honest. Yeah, photon is a little particle of light. They're everywhere around you all the time. I have a special place in my heart where photons. But also the top quark is great. Um, uh, Higgs boson is really fantastic. <laughs> uh, some of the more speculative particles, like dark photons, those are good, too. I like them all. <laughs> okay. Well, um, well, thank you very much for coming. I really look forward to your talk talk later today Thanks and to we have a um, great schedule here at TNW today so I encourage you to stay tuned into TNW TV and we're signing off. Thanks for watching. <laughs>